In uh, today's message, <clears throat> we're continuing in uh, 1 Timothy, and Brother Ethan is our reader this morning, so would you please come, sir? Uh, good morning, IBC. Uh, today's scripture reading will be from 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 to 13, so would you please stand with me? Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Let us, let us pray this morning. Father, <clears throat> reveal your word to us, I pray, and may our hearts be open and receptive to it. As we examine uh, this concept of deacons being servants and and uh, Lord, not just them, but the, the attitude and nature of followers of Christ and how we are to act, how we are to serve as well. Help us to understand these truths this morning. Open our hearts. Father, if there is anybody who is still unsure of their own salvation, their own standing with you through Jesus Christ, I pray today, Lord, you would work in that person's heart that your Holy Spirit would draw them and convict them of their need, of their sin. In Jesus' name, and we say, Amen. So today we're on the second part of chapter 3, or part of the second part. And, and the first part was the elders. Last week we looked at that. Uh, we established in the church... Uh, uh, Baptist, and in our view as an independent Baptist church as well, is that the Lord established two offices in the church. The first office being pastors, the second being deacons. Uh, pastors are referred to as a, a, a number of different terms. What were some of the terms? Oh, elders, that, that was the primary one that we looked at, elders. Bishop was another one. Overseers. And of course, pastor, uh, where we, each one of those are referring to the same office, the same person, uh, but they're different aspects of that ministry. Uh, as we look at a bishop, an overseer, of course, bishop and overseer is the same thing. It's the word episkopos, and it, it means to watch out. It is that responsibility of looking after the flock. As we look at elder, it's referring to their maturity and as a follower of Christ. They're not a novice. They're not brand new. They have uh, been growing and learning the word. And then we look at the pastor, which focuses on the, the feeding of the flock and shepherding a flock in that, in that way. Of course, the chief shepherd being Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd. Today, we're looking at the other office that is mentioned in scripture, and that is that of the deacon, the deacon. I read of a farmer who had a, a team of horses uh, who pulled a wagon, a team, and there was always one horse that always pulled harder and stronger than all the other horses. Someone asked the farmer about this, and the farmer stated that they're all willing horses. One is willing to pull and do the work, and the others are willing to let him. <laughs> they're all willing, though. Sometimes church is kind of that way, isn't it? You know, you have a few who are willing to do the work. They're the ones who are willing to step up and help and get stuck in and be a part. And serve and find needs that, 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 that we have in the church. And they're willing to do the work. And the others are willing to let them do the work. That's not the way it should be. That's not the way God would have it to be. To better understand the office mentioned in our text this morning, I think we need to first do a brief 
look in the New Testament at service, this idea of service. And so the first point in your notes would be this. All Christians are servants. All Christians are servants. No exceptions. You're a follower of Christ. You are then willing to develop into a servant. Why is that? Why does being a follower of Christ equate to being a servant? Well, we see, first of all, Christ is our example. He's our example. Do you ever wonder, have you ever thought, uh, step back and, and ask, why did God send his son the way he did? When Jesus Christ came, he was uh, God incarnate. That is, God in the flesh, he took upon human form and body, he came to be one of us. Why did he come the way he did? He could have come as anything. He could have been born into the rich family of Herod's household and had everything, had the best care, the best foods, the best education, the best accommodations. He could have had it all. But instead, God chose a poor carpenter and his wife through which God the Son would come. The Son of God grew up in a very modest home, a modest existence, and in fact he learned a trade to work with his own hands. And so he didn't have the softer hands of a scholar, he had harder hands of a craftsman. When Jesus began his ministry, he had to deal with this issue of servanthood with his disciples. They would argue with each other who was going to be the big shot in heaven, who was going to have the most importance when they got to heaven in God's kingdom, who was going to be the highest rank, who was going to be the one sitting at the right hand, who would get the positions of honor. Jesus said in Matthew 20, Verse 26, he's teaching them. He says, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your, your what? Servant. Whoever desires to be great, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Jesus turns everything upside down. He says, this is what I've come to show you. This is the kind of leadership that I am showing you. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Over in Luke chapter 22... Jesus said in verse 28, yet I am among you as the one who serves. I am the one who is serving. I am the Messiah. I am your rabbi, your leader, your instructor, but I'm the one who's serving. Jesus demonstrated this very concept at the Last Supper. We have our table set up for supper this morning, but at the Last Supper, Jesus took his disciples when they got into the room, and as was common, they took off their sandals, and they tied up, freshened up, and washed feet, but this was usually done by servants or slaves in the household, but Jesus took up the basin. Jesus took up a towel, and he sat in front of their feet, and he washed the dust and the dirt off their feet and dried them with the towel. And when he got done doing that, his statement was, as I have done to you, so ought you to do for one another. I've shown you what it is to lead through servanthood, and I want you to do that for each other now. He picked up their dirty, smelly feet and washed them. Can you imagine? So, Christ is our example, but next, being like Christ means serving others. He said in John 13, uh, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you know these things, do you know them? If you do what? If you uh, do them, do what then is he referring to? He's saying if you're washing smelly feet. How many of you are washing smelly feet? Do the servant's jobs. Serve others. And sometimes it may mean washing a smelly foot. But oftentimes it may mean other things. Other things that you might think, oh, that's beneath me. That's not my role. That's not my place. This morning in our, in our members class, we, we had uh, another four complete and finished the membership class of the church. And, and we're glad to see more come in and, and say, I want to be committed, be a part. But I took them through and I, I reminded them that uh, part of being a member and fully committed as a member is to have a servant's heart, a servant's attitude. And that servant's attitude is one that says, uh, I am willing to help and to serve in any way. And it's not beneath me. Every once in a while, I come to church and I see somebody, it could be on a Sunday or it could be on uh, another day of the week, but I see them getting out of their car and they might see some rubbish in the car park. I don't know how it gets there, but we always have some rubbish in the car park. I think people come and eat and, and throw out their rubbish out the window or blows in. I don't know, but we always have rubbish in the car park. But if someone comes and I see them get out and they see the rubbish and they pick it up and they bring it in to toss it, that blesses my heart because I see that's a servant's attitude because it'd be easy to say, you know, that's not my role. When is somebody going to go around and pick up the rubbish around here? Uh, whose job is it? When are the rubbish picker-uppers going to come and do their job? It's Sunday after all. But rather we have a church that is full of people who are, are, are servant leaders like Christ. And they say, hey, wait a second. This is not beneath me to pick up the rubbish. This is my church. This belongs to the Lord. I want to take care of it. I want to look after it. Servant leadership. You may at times have to help people, and helping them may mean they can do nothing back to help you. That can be possible. You're not doing it so that, you know, they owe you a favor in return. Sometimes you're doing it because you're going to love them like Jesus Christ loved. You're going to give of yourself as a servant, not expecting them to serve you back in return. This is part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Are you going to be a follower of Christ? Are you willing to be a follower of Christ? Third, we see Christ has gifted some, especially, to serve. We're all called to be servants, but all of us have different spiritual giftings, and some may be called especially to serve in a special capacity. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, we see Paul referencing gifts that the Holy Spirit has given. It says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching... I just want you to notice that word ministering there. That particular word just means service. That's what it means, in service. God has gifted some to teach. God has given, gifted some to proclaim God's word. And, and there's many other areas of gifting that people may have, but some have this particular gifting of serving, service. Christians all need to serve in various ways, but some are specially gifted by God for service in supportive, practical roles behind the scenes. It's that way evangelism. We're all to share Christ, 
but God has gifted some with the gift of evangelism, and, and they have a unique spiritual gift in that. But the same with help, same with ministering, service. God has gifted some uniquely to serve in supportive, practical roles behind the scenes. If you want to picture like a team, when I was young, I, I mean, I, I'm a rugby guy. I like, I like to watch a rugby. Um, anybody watch the game last night? Yeah, yeah. It was interesting. It wasn't convincing, but it was a win, right? Amen. <clears throat> We'll take it. We'll take anything against England. Uh, uh, I had a Pommy watching with me last night. Where, where is that Pommy? Yeah, he's around somewhere. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, when I was younger, I played American football. I lived in California for a couple of years in, in, in uh, uh, middle school. So I played American football. <clears throat> you know what position I played? No, don't say water boy or something stupid like that. <laughs> it's not funny. Now, I was on the uh, front row. I was on the offensive front line. Uh, now, if you watch American football, you know those are the big guys. Okay, so 10, 11, 12, I was a big guy. Uh, I guess, you know, I changed as I got older and grew up a bit. So I was one of the big guys on the front offensive line. Uh, the, the point is, is that all the glory goes to which player? The quarterback. He's the guy everyone wants to be. He's the guy that gets the ball. He passes the ball. He looks cool. He doesn't get tackled so much. And, and you know, they score points. And, oh, what an awesome quarterback. He gets the big money. The front line, the front right guard, which is what I was, nobody knows his name. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They don't care about him. But he's a servant to the team. He's the one that helps make it possible so that the guy in the back is looking good, has time to do what he's got to do, gets the ball to where it has to go, and they score points. And if the front line, if the servants were on the front weren't doing their jobs, he couldn't do his job. That's the point. And so when it comes to the church, we need everybody. But God has gifted some to be able to serve in such a way, even behind the lines, so that the ministry continues, the ministry can thrive and do well. And anyway, let's move on. Number two, some should serve in this official capacity as a deacon. In the Bible, we see that the New Testament church grew. And these official servants became known as deacons in the church. Let's first look at the office recognized in Scripture. Most agree that the official deacon in the church uh, had its start in the book of Acts chapter 6 in the first six verses. The church had grown a lot and the apostles found themselves getting far too busy with mundane things. Uh, what's mentioned here is waiting tables, uh, taking care of of people at the tables, making sure the widows had uh, what they needed, and they were focusing on these things instead of focusing on the ministry, on prayer, and on the Word of God, and giving and preparing and teaching the Word. In this short passage, there were seven men chosen to take care of these tasks, to free up the apostles for the work of the ministry. Seven men were chosen. The problem in the church arose, the Bible says, the, the, the Greek-speaking Jews felt that their widows were being neglected in favor of the Hebrew-speaking uh, uh, widows. And later in Philippians, Paul addresses the book to um, two groups. In Philippians 1.1, he says, Paul and Timothy bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops, the overseers, and the deacons. So he mentions both of these different groups within the church in Philippi. And so we, we do see this 
official formation of these two offices within the church, different parts, different functions, uh, but we see deacons in particular mentioned. Most assume deacons may not always be necessary in every church. Uh, IBC went for a number of years without having a deacon. But as churches would grow and as the needs become greater, then they should take on uh, people in the church to be able to take care of these functions behind the scenes to enable the ministry to continue to grow and thrive. Now, let's look at our text. Qualifications spelled out in Scripture. Sometimes people get the idea that it works like this. If you're really, really spiritual, then you could be qualified to be a pastor. If you're less spiritual, then you might become a deacon. And then there's all the rest, right? That's not the way it should be. Last week, if you remember, as we were looking through all the qualifications of the elder, of the overseer, bishop, uh, pastor, as we were looking through all those qualifications, we saw that there was nothing particularly extraordinary about them. They weren't super high qualifications which eliminate 95% of the congregation. In fact, we see that they're pretty much expected for the Christian life. They're pretty much the expected norm for believers. This is the way it should look growing in Christ and walking with Christ. And, and yes, of course, if you're going to lead, you should be this as well. And same when we come to the deacons. Uh, the, these are descriptions of the normal Christian life, not the extraordinary, the few, the chosen, but the normal. First of all, we see it must be reverent. Uh, look at verse 8, reverent. Likewise, deacons must be reverent. Uh, there's another way it could be translated, and that is dignified, dignified. In other words, a deacon's not just a constant goofball, a constant clown, uh, someone that you can't really take seriously, uh, but as one who is respected by those around them. There's a respect. doesn't mean a deacon can't tell jokes. It doesn't mean a, a, an elder can't enjoy a, a good time and enjoy a good laugh as well, but, but they are respected and taken seriously also by those who know them. That's what this is indicating. We see next, a deacon must not be double-tongued. What is double-tongued? Um, a deacon must not be one who is known to say different things to different people in order to try to just please everybody. Okay? Their focus is on the Word, and the focus is on the Lord. Okay? I want to please the Lord. He's my desire. He's my goal. Um, if it pleases man, then that's great, and I want to encourage you in the Lord, but I'm not going to just want be saying things to please you so that you like me, that you are not upset at me. Must be a man of his word, uh, not double-tongued, but a man who says uh, the same thing consistently all the time. Why? It's important. As a deacon, there may be responsibility given in the church and even financial responsibilities. And we got to be able to trust that this person is a man of their word. The third thing we see is not given, again, like the elders, to, to wine. Uh, verse 8 says, not given to much wine. Not given to much wine. Uh, again, the importance is exercising this self-control and not being addicted to anything. We see number four, must not be greedy for money. You must not be greedy for money. It's a good thing. Being a deacon doesn't pay well, uh, so they don't do it for the money. But it's an overall attitude that, that um, was being talked about here. The deacon's duties may involve money, and we have to be able to trust them and entrust them with the finances and the handling of the finances of the church. 
And by the way, in regards to finances and the finances of the church, uh, I want to throw this out there in case you did not know. Uh, after church on Sundays, it's not Pastor Mike and I who go gather the offering together and we count it and then we go to the bank and we put it in and I say, how much do you want this week, Mike? And uh, we take our cut. Uh, you know, it, it, it hasn't, it's never worked that way uh, with us in this church. Uh, we have gifted men uh, who take responsibility for uh, taking the finances and counting it. We don't handle any of that. Uh, the church office, and we have a couple of ladies who take care of all the um, details of the bills and, and handling of the finances. So that is out of our, our, our hands. I think that's a good thing. That's the way it should be. And I've always made it part of my uh, ministry to, I, I don't know who gives what and who gives how much. I don't want to know those things. Uh, Pastor Mike doesn't want to know those things. We don't need to know those things. And so as we minister and shepherd, it's not going to be based on, ooh, they're a good giver. I better take extra good care of this person. <laughs> or this one's pretty cheap. You know, we don't need to... <laughs> We don't need to visit them in hospital this week. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It shouldn't work that way. And so it's good to have gifted men with a servant role that we can trust, that has these qualifications, and they're not greedy for money. They're not in it for the money. They're in it to serve the Lord, and, and they can be trustworthy. We need that. Five, must hold the mystery of the, the faith with a pure conscience. Verse 9, this is simply meaning they have a clear understanding themselves of the gospel, what it's about. They know Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is their message. That's the church's message. Um, not only does he have these convictions of these central truths in his mind and his, in his knowledge, but he also lives in obedience. So when it says the mystery of the faith... That's that mystery of the gospel. Paul often referred to it that way, that mystery which unites not only man with God, but man with man, Jew and Gentile alike, cross-culture. The uniting power of the gospel of Christ to make us a new people, a new, uh, um, a new race. That is what the gospel does. And so they have this understanding, and they are living it out in obedience that is that pure conscience. We see next, he must be tested. Verse 10 says, but let, also, let these also first be tested. Let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. This is simply saying such a one has a proven record. They have shown themselves to be faithful, reliable, trustworthy, uh, everyone knows them, and they can attest to that. There's nothing uh, said against them. They have been observed. The point is, is you don't put someone into office to try to get them involved and see how they do if they step up to the plate a little bit, and, and hopefully they'll, they'll work out. No. He's, the opposite is supposed to be the case. You see them functioning. You see their faithfulness. They're regular. Uh, you can always count on them. They're ready to serve. They're always wanting to serve. And it's those that we say, that should be someone that we can consider as a deacon in the church. You test first, and then you put them in. The next criteria is that must be a one-woman man. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. One wife at a time, okay, guys? Ruling their children and their own house as well. Same as with the elders. This is the same thing as with the elders. It refers to moral purity, a, a moral a cleanness, a, a, a commitment. We saw last week God's expectations of marriage. As we were looking at the qualifications for the elder, who is also to be the husband of one wife. It doesn't indicate necessarily that they must be married. We, we examined that as well. Paul himself 
was not married during his ministry. And he says, I, I, I wish that you were as I am. For you can devote and commit yourself more fully to the work of the Lord. But if you have a wife, if you have a family, then your, your cares are for worldly things. Because you have to take care of them. And so when it comes to the deacon, the same thing applies. Not necessarily have to be married. But if he is married, he is committed. Committed to one uh, woman. Just one woman. Um, we saw three reasons for marriage vows to be broken. Three potential reasons for marriage vows to be broken. What were those? Do you remember? Uh, the Bible's clear. God made man woman. And, and he's the one that established the family. God hates divorce. God never intended for divorce. He never designed divorce. In fact, Jesus says, Moses allowed divorce because of the hardness and sin of your own hearts. Okay? But Jesus gave an example for someone who could uh, divorce his wife. And then Paul added another one. And then there's a third obvious one. But what's the first one? Hmm? Unfaithfulness. Unfaithfulness. Jesus mentioned that clause. Anyone leaves his wife except for unfaithfulness, committed adultery. So, marital unfaithfulness, that is when your partner, not you, but your partner, your marriage spouse, breaks your vows and is unfaithful with somebody else, um, that is one exception. But the other one, Paul mentioned an unbelieving spouse who desires to leave, does not want to stay in the commitment, in the relationship. Paul says, let them go. Paul did say to them, if they're willing to stay with you, you stay. You stay committed. You're not the one that decides to leave the unbelieving spouse. But if they choose to, if they decide they cannot take it for the sake of peace, he says, let them go. And of course, the third reason for a marriage vow to be broken, death, okay? Okay. When we say our vows, we say, till death do us part. Um, till death do us part. If your spouse dies, you are free from that. The Bible says you can marry another and not be an adulterer or an adulteress for uh, these things. So these, this teaching applies to deacons. It applies to pastors. It is the norm, though. Now, we know that we live in a fallen world, and sometimes we have to deal with situations, and they're not always easy to deal with. Sometimes you have to try to make the best of a difficult situation in regards to marriages, in regards to relationships, and the messiness that people get themselves into. And then they come to Christ, and they say, okay, let's sort this all out, and sometimes it's not easy. But this is the norm. This is to be the norm in the Christian life, and so this is the standard for uh, the servant of the church, the deacon. And then we come to <clears throat> number eight, must be a good manager of the home. Again, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things, ruling their children and their houses well. Um, a, a lot, just, we looked at this with the elders last week. It is not uh, saying that you don't have times when, uh, especially as your ch children become adults, they are accountable to God for their own actions, for their own decisions. Uh, but as a home, as a family, you have done all you can to make it a home that honors and follows Christ in the home. As with elders... The idea should never be to let people get more involved by serving as deacons or just because they're willing to do it, but they must have proven spiritual maturity. Their lives are showing it, they're consistent, and there's nothing in particular inconsistent about it. They're walking with the Lord. Then we see mentioned here rewards, rewards. Verse 13, for those who have 
served well as deacons, obtained for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. They obtained a good standing. What is this referring to? You serve as a deacon, good job, you've attained a good standing. It doesn't mean, it shouldn't mean necessarily in front of the church, uh, everyone looks up to you, good job, and we pat you on the back. But it's more in reference to before God rather than before man. God sees, God knows, God understands, a faithful servant, uh, God recognizes. God will reward faithfulness to him. You attain a good standing before the Lord for your faithfulness to him in service in the church. We also see um, that Jesus, our example, humbled himself, but it was God the Father that exalted him. We see in Ephesians 2.8, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him. It was God who noticed. It was God who exalted him for his faithfulness, even to the point of the cross. And likewise, it is God who sees his faithful servants faithfully, with the right attitude, with the right spirit, serving the Lord week after week as well. But the other thing that they, the reward, they have a good standing, but the other thing is great boldness in the faith. Great boldness in the faith. Um, this great boldness could refer to either Confidence before God or confidence before men. They have great boldness in the faith in their service to the Lord. A faithful servant who is walking with the Lord and in obedience to the Lord comes boldly before him in prayer. If there is something between you and God, if there is a problem, if there is sin in your life and, and that is a hindrance to your prayer life, then that's a problem. But one who is serving the Lord and obeying the Lord in confidence comes before him. It could be that, but likewise, we also have a quiet confidence in, in dealing with people, <clears throat> knowing their experience that they have walking with the Lord firsthand. They are walking with the Lord. They have a good understanding of that mystery of the gospel and a clear conscience because they're walking with the Lord, they have a confidence that God's promises are true because they have witnessed it themselves. And so when it comes to helping people as servants in the church, as deacons in the church, they can have this um, confidence in, with other people as well. Not self-confidence, don't misunderstand, but it's this confidence in God from your experience of being with God. And it's that confidence as you're serving the Lord faithfully, you can be confident with other people as well. So whether you are an official servant or otherwise, there's no shortage of work within the church if you're willing to wash dirty feet. Are you willing to wash dirty feet? Are you willing to get your hands dirty and wash and serve other people? All of us are called to be servants. There's no exception to that. We don't select, uh, at this church, we have five official deacons. It's not that we selected five servants of the church and you all just sit back and let them serve you. But these are five who have already been serving like all Christians should. They've already been serving in many ways, and now they serve officially to help in the task of the church, in the background often, so that the work of the church can go on. But are you, my fellow church members, willing to be a servant in the church as well? 
You must be. There's no exceptions. This is not optional. All us pastors, the elders, bishops, whatever you want to call them, they need to be servants in the church. Official deacons are servants of the church. But every single member must have the attitude of Christ who became a servant to all, even to the point of the cross. Stand with me, if you would, for a moment. As we come to <clears throat> the cross, we need to take a moment to think on these things. As we come to the table, the Lord's table here has, has been set for us. We need to ask ourselves some questions. The first question, obviously, is, are you in the faith? And by that, I just mean, have you trusted Jesus? Is he your savior? I'm not asking if you've been pretty faithful to go to church, or even if you've been baptized, or a church member, but is Jesus Christ your savior, your Lord? Have you trusted him? Has he forgiven you all of your sins? Is he your personal savior? If not, that is the first thing you need to take care of this morning. Trust Jesus. Repent of your sin. Say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Come into my life. Cleanse me from all my sin. I want to follow you today as Lord and Savior of my life. If you are a Christian, as most of you in here would attest, you are born again, you are saved, then this morning you need to acknowledge you are also a servant. That is what you are. Christ, our example, and he led by example of serving all, even to the point of washing dirty, smelly feet. And he says, I want you to do the same. We are no better than our master. We are no better than him. And we need to be willing to get our hands dirty and to sometimes do things that may not always be pleasant, but it needs to be done because we need to serve others. There's a need. And we don't do those needs so that we'll get it in return. We do it to serve our master and Lord. Because he led us, he gave us the example. Will you commit yourself this morning to being that kind of a servant? The church must be full of deacons, full of servants. Every member is a servant. Will you commit in your heart this morning to be that kind of a servant? Let's pray together. Father, I pray for any here who may not be in the faith yet. I pray that this morning they would trust you as their Savior and Lord, that they would um, repent of all their sin and ask you to cleanse them and save them, Lord, this morning. And Father, may they come and testify to that and share with us and let us know so that we can help them, encourage them, and help them to grow. And Lord, for my brothers and sisters here who are born again, they are in the faith. I pray, Lord, that each one of us would see that we are called not to be served, but to serve. May we have that same attitude of Christ. Take the towel, take the basin, and be willing to wash the dirty, smelly things. Lord, may we be willing to humble ourselves and be used like Christ was used and be obedient even unto death. Lord, may Christ be our example. And may this church be filled with people who are truly servant-minded. Not position-minded. Not like the apostles who were trying to figure out who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. But may our hearts be that of a servant. Thank you for Jesus, who came not to be served, but he came to serve and gave himself for many. He gave himself for us. Thank you, Lord. And as we go uh, gather around the table this morning, help us to remember what Jesus did for us and the price that was paid in Jesus' name. Please take a seat if you would.